Welcome to the Hebraic Roots Network. I'm Valerie Moody of Hebrew Discovery Ministries. Did you know that you will dine with Abraham one day? The people who are in the kingdom of God will sit at the table and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to talk about this today, but before we talk about this, let me introduce myself. I have been a Hebrew Roots teacher for more than 10 years. I love the God of Israel with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. Kol avav, kol nefesh, kol meod. I teach for one reason, and that is to create a deeper love for God and to help us see our Creator in a deeper way. I study the Hebrew roots of my faith to understand and know Yeshua better. Hebrew roots are a way to see Yeshua in the context of his life as an observant Jew. When we understand Yeshua within the context of his culture, we know what he was thinking and we understand the deeper meaning of his parables. With a Hebrew perspective, we know Yeshua better. When I study the Torah, I always come away with a fresh revelation of Yeshua, my Messiah and my King. Yeshua was born into a Jewish family, and he was an observant, perfectly obedient son. He studied the Torah himself, and he went to the temple in Jerusalem. Years ago, when I was learning this about him, I was also discovering God's feast days. And when I couldn't find a book that answered all of my questions about the feasts, I wrote one. The result of that effort is a book called The Feast of Adonai. The Feast of Adonai is the most comprehensive and best-selling book on God's feast days today. You can explore this book and other teachings at www.vmoody.com. I think you will really enjoy that book. It has been a bestseller for many, many years. You are watching the Hebraic Roots Network. This network is the vision of many Hebrew Roots teachers and the tireless efforts of a few precious servants of God. Please support the Hebraic Roots Network. This network is going to lead you to the Heavenly Father and to Yeshua, his Messiah King. It, with your support, this network will keep solid biblical teaching on the internet. But as a team, you need to know that you're part of that team. So if you can help support Hebraic Roots Network, we can work together to bring you these teachings. When God is blessed in the daily prayer service, he is blessed as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the patriarchs of Israel and the ancestors of every author of Scripture. Now think about that for a minute. They are mentioned every day in daily prayers all across the world. The names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come easily to mind because each of them add a message to our faith. Abraham shows us faith through a mountain. Isaac shows us faith through a field. And Jacob shows us faith through a house. Each of them contribute to our faith in the one true God of heaven and earth. They point to our Heavenly Father and to his Messiah, Yeshua. But the mystery is this. The mountain of Abraham, the field of Isaac, and the house of Jacob are all one divine location. This divine location can be seen on a map of Israel, and yet this divine location is inside of us. What do we know about the place where the mountain of Abraham, the field of Isaac, and the house of Jacob divinely intersect? Well, it's a mystery that we're going to explore together. Today's topic is dining with Abraham, the father of faith. The great life of Abraham occupies more scripture than any other personal narrative in the Bible outside the words and the teachings of Yeshua. So we really need to know about this father of our, faith, of our faith. His name is mentioned over 300 times in scripture. He is the father of the Hebrews and the father of all of those who believe. He is the Ava Shel Imuna, the father of faith. In one way or another, Abraham was journeying toward the mountain all of his life. 
he faced challenges that were like mountains until he reached his ultimate test. He is a great example of endurance and perseverance under trials, something that will increase in the days ahead for everyone on the face of the earth. We will all go through at least one severe trial in our lives. It benefits us to seriously study and emulate Abraham's life and learn from him. He gave us two new names for God that had never been spoken before. Our first lesson from Abraham comes from the city of his birth. Abraham was born east of Babylon in Ur of the Chaldees. This is located in modern-day Iraq. Ur is in southern Iraq, and the meaning of its name is significant. Ur means flame. Ur comes from the Hebrew word or, which is Strong's Concordance number 215, meaning to shine like a light. So as a city, Ur was a bright city. It was full of light. It was jewel-like. It was a glistening city of light. Now that's very interesting, something we may not have known about the location of Abraham's birth. Now, Ur of the Chaldees. The word Chaldees is also significant. Ur was in the region of the Chaldees. The name Chaldees means field or clod breakers. So Ur was a shining light in a farmer's field. People came to the city lights of Ur. Yet this was one of the most sinful ancient cities. It sparkled not with light, but in sin and darkness. The name Ur of the Chaldees has a numerical value. It is not the number 666, but it is close. It has a numerical value of 586, the total value of the Hebrew letters in the name. It is no coincidence that the number 586 is also the numerical value of Jerusalem, the name Jerusalem. Both Ur and Jerusalem have a numerical value of 586. Now, Ur glowed with sin in the kingdom of Nimrod. Jerusalem, on the other hand, glowed with righteousness in the kingdom of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. By discovering this connection, we see that Ur of the Chaldees was not just another city, it was a counterfeit Jerusalem. Abraham was born in a counterfeit Jerusalem. This is the meaning of the name Ur of, of the Chaldees, the place of Abraham's birth. Now, very little is known or told in Scripture about Abraham's early life, except a few hints here and there. The Torah mentions hardly anything about the early years of Abraham, the father of Israel, and the father of our faith. Such an important event is Abraham's defiance of Nimrod and his ordeal in a burning furnace is only hinted at in scripture. As classic literature tells the story, Abraham's father, Terah, which is pronounced Terak in Hebrew, was part of an elite class of people in Nimrod's kingdom. He was well respected throughout the land and served as one of Nimrod's advisors. Now Nimrod was the first king mentioned in scripture. Before Nimrod, there were neither kings nor reigning monarchies. He was the most powerful man during Abraham's early life. He was the most powerful man in the world in Abraham's lifetime. Now Nimrod ruled over Ur of the Chaldees and many other regions in the world, many other lands. So he ruled over the area where Abraham was born, his hometown, so to speak. Abraham grew up around Nimrod the leader of all the heathens and all pagan idolatry. Scripture tells us very little about Abraham's father, Terak, except that he worshipped idols. Joshua 24.2 says, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your fathers lived of old time beyond the river, even Terak, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So Terah worshipped other gods. He did not worship the God of Scripture. Abraham grew up surrounded by his father's idols. This is not something we think about very often. 
According to tradition, Terek was a highly successful manufacturer and seller of idols, so people came to him to buy their household idols. Now even Laban, the father of Rachel and Leah, had household idols in Genesis 31:19. So in this area of the world, in this region, people had idols in their home. They had their own little shrines in the house where they worshipped. Now Terak did a brisk business as an idol maker. So Abraham was born into a spiritually dark home, into a home that was filled with the sin of idolatry. His father Terak did not know God, and neither did Abraham in his early years. Most of us don't think about that, but this was his upbringing, this is where he was born. Some of us were born into non-believing families as well. Yet our early upbringing cannot hinder what God has planned to do in us. This is something we need to remember. Abraham was born into a sinful family, but it did not hinder God's plan for Abraham. If we were born in a family like this, if our early upbringing was like this, we need to be encouraged by the fact that our early upbringing will not hinder what God wants to do in and through us. He has a destiny for each of us, and that's what we need to remember. Now, classic literature tells us quite a bit about Abraham and about his father. This is a story I want to share from classic literature. Classic literature tells us that Terak's friends were feasting with him on the night that Abraham was born. They were in the house when he was born. Now, Abraham, according to tradition, was born in the year 1948. And this means 1948 years from the time that God created Adam. Now, some accounts place his birth in the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the year, of the religious year. Other accounts place his birth in the month of Tishri, which is the first month in the social year. Now, it, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, it's likely to be that he was born in the month of Nisan because Abraham is associated with Passover. He is one who crossed over, and so he is connected with this feast of God, the feast of Passover. So I believe he was born in the month of Nisan. Now, the idea with either month is that Abraham was born as the first of his kind, and that's why he was born in the first month of the year. He was the only one in his generation who was searching for the truth. Now, as the first to seek God, Abraham was totally unique. He was a revolutionary in a world that had fallen into the pagan worship of the planets and the stars. At the outset of his journey, Abraham was alone. He had no teachers in Babylon. He had no alternative but to follow the yearnings of his own heart. So the Spirit of God was working with his heart. God knew that the end goal was the mountain of Abraham. But at this point, Abraham was a pioneer in a world that was worshiping the constellations. His ancestor, ancestor helped make Abraham different. He was a direct descendant of Noah's son, Shem. Now, Shem was 390 years old when Abraham was born. We're not given much history about Shem in Scripture or what type of person he was, but his name provides us with a clue. Unlike our names, a Hebrew name was a word with a meaning, and it still is today. This meaning was a reflection of the person and his character. The Hebrew name Shem is Strong's Concordance number 8034. It's most often translated as the word name. Yet in 1 Kings 431, we see that the word Shem is used to describe Solomon's widespread fame. So Shem can also mean fame. It means reputation, character, fame, glory, and monument. Shem was a key ancestor for Abraham we see that the word Shem is related to the Hebrew word Neshama, Strong's Concordance number 5397. The word Shem is contained inside the word Neshama. If you look closely, you'll see the word Shem there in the middle of the word Neshama. Neshama means breath. 
In the Hebrew mind, breath is the seat of one's character. Since Shem's name means character, we can conclude that he was a man of character. Now Noah, Shem, and their descendant Eber, which in Hebrew is pronounced Aver, were Abraham's successors, who were all living at the time that Abraham was born. At the time of his birth, they were alive. They had stories to tell about God, and they had secrets to share. We see that Aver's name comes from the Hebrew word Avar, Strong's Concordance number 5674, which means to cross over to another region or to go to the other side. Now this is what God asked Abraham to do. God wanted Abraham to cross over from the idolatrous land of Nimrod's kingdom. We see that, that Abraham's name also had a meaning. His given name was Avram, which comes from the Hebrew words Av and Ram. Av means father, and Ram is a primitive Hebrew root word meaning to be exalted and lifted up. So Avram means my father is exalted, or the exalted one is my father. Now God changed Abraham's name by placing the letter He in his name. In biblical literature, we see that names show us what is really going on in the story. So we need to pay very close attention to the fact that God changed Abraham's name. God reconstructed Avram's name to become Avraham, and in so doing, he reconstructed his destiny. God placed the letter He in Avram's name. It appears right after the letter Resh. Now suddenly, much to our amazement, there is a new word sitting in the middle of Avraham's name. By adding the letter He, it forms a new word in the center of Avraham's name. The letters Bet, Resh, and He spell another word. The new word in his name is bara, spelled Bet, Resh, and He. It's related to the Hebrew word bara, Strong's Concordance number 1254, meaning to create, transform, and cut, as in cutting a covenant. Now that's pretty fascinating to learn that about his name. So in placing the word bara in the middle of his name, God was placing a covenant within Abraham that would ultimately lead to the Messiah. So the Hebrew name Abraham is really, when you think about it, is the most extraordinary name ever constructed. As a pioneer, Abraham asked, what is the ultimate power and source of all things? And God answered him using the stars, which was something that Abraham understood. God took him outside to see the stars. Genesis 15:5 says, And God took Abraham outside, and he said, Look up to the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. When God took Abraham out to see the stars, he was reaching him on a level that was already familiar to him. Abraham was already a master of the stars, but God was leading him beyond the stars, beyond astronomy, beyond astrology. He was provoking Abraham to contemplate the universe and to see its creator, to see him. God said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham heard him and he trusted. Now I want us to look at the next slide. In studying the stars, Abraham applied what is known as Binah, which is Strong's Concordance number 998. It means understanding. He had understanding about the stars, but God wanted more for him. He wanted him to rise above understanding to Hakma, Strong's number 2451, which means wisdom. Wisdom is above understanding. By acquiring wisdom, Abraham rejected the pagan worship around him and began a new journey with God. Abraham was a citizen in Nimrod's kingdom, but God was about to change that. Abraham had absolutely no trouble hearing God speak to him in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. 
I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. God told Abraham, move out. If you will move out, I will greatly bless you. He was telling him to leave his family and depart from his homeland, depart from Nimrod's kingdom. If Avram walked away from the, his idolatrous relatives and culture, he would become a blessing. Now, blessing is the word barakah. God called Abraham a barakah. Strong's number 1293, which means blessing, and it's related to kneeling. By calling him a barakah, or blessing, God was saying that Abraham bowed to him, and Abraham would be a source of blessing and prosperity for the entire world. Now, Abraham's father celebrated on the night he was born, according to ancient literature. When Terak's friends left the house that night, they observed an unusual star in the sky. The star appeared to swallow up four other stars there in the heavens. So on the night that Abraham was born, according to legend, there were unusual signs in the sky. The advisors immediately took their report to Nimrod. Oh, Nimrod, they said, a baby has been born, has been born who is destined to outshine you in the world. Now offer his parents a large sum of money for the child and then kill him. That's what they told Nimrod. Let's take a moment to look at the life of Nimrod and how this information, how he would have received this information. He was the supreme ruler, as we said, in Abraham's world. Nimrod was the son of Cush, the son of Ham, the son of Noah. Now Noah cursed Ham's son, Canaan, and subsequently cursed the entire family line in Genesis 9.25. And so Nimrod came from a cursed family line. The name Nimrod is not Hebrew, but it is a Semitic name that is closely related to Hebrew. It is related to the Hebrew word Marad, Strong's number 4775, meaning to be contentious and rebellious. This name is the idea of rebelling and revolting against a father, against God, and against light. The Hebrew verb marad occurs about 25 times in scripture, usually in scenes relating to rebellion. If we study the etymology of names, we learn that a person's name can be closely related to their character. Now this was the case with Nimrod. His name fits well with his personality in scripture. He is mentioned only in Genesis 10, 8 through 12. Now that's not a very long passage, but it speaks volumes about who he was and what he did. It tells us much about the character of Nimrod. In the ego-driven philosophy of the post-flood world, Nimrod proved to be a brilliant leader. He gathered the entire world under a single, single banner. And as a leader, a charismatic leader, he was able to do that. He had the ability to ensnare the minds of people with his speech and deceive them into rebelling against God. Under his inspiration, people built Babylon and the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11:4 says, Let us build a city and a tower whose top reaches unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Tower of Babel was designed to reach up to heaven. Heaven is the Hebrew word Shemayim. Now that's Strong's Concordance number 8064. And this is how it is defined. Shemayim is defined as the abode of God. So the Targum translation builds on this in Genesis 11.4. The Targum translation adds a detail about the tower. It was, um, it was designed for false religious worship. And the, the Targum translation of the Bible makes no bones about saying that blatantly and clearly. The people at the Tower of Babel were engaged in false worship. With Nimrod as, as their head, 
They wanted to elevate themselves up to a level that was on par with God. Now that was the purpose of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel functioned in the opposite way that the Temple in Jerusalem functioned later. The Tower took men up to God. God's Temple, on the other hand, was a place where God came down. With the Tower, men went up. With the Temple, God came down. We can see that at the Tower of Babel, everyone in the world was speaking one language. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have, they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Now the entire world spoke one language, including Abraham, and that language was Hebrew. Hebrew was the original language that God spoke with Adam and Hava in the Garden of Eden. And so Hebrew was the language that was being spoken all over the world at this time. It was the pure language. And if we read Zephaniah 3, 8 and 3, 9, we know that one day God is going to restore a pure language to us. But in Abraham's day, everyone was speaking Hebrew. And so Hebrew was spoken by the entire world until God confused their language at the Tower of Babel. Now, traditionally, Abraham was 48 years old when Nimrod and his followers began to build the Tower of Babel. So this was a structure that Abraham saw with his own eyes. His father, Terak, would have supported Nimrod's efforts to do this because he was in the circle of advisors around Nimrod. Now, these were the political leanings of Abraham's family. Somehow, he would seek God himself. He would escape his upbringing. The apocryphal literature writes about Abraham's spiritual awakening at the age of 14. Abraham started to pray as a teenager, asking God to save him from the astrology worship of his father's house. That comes from the book of Jubilees in the apocryphal literature. Now, Abraham must have had some spiritual understanding because God was able to reach him. That's what we need to know, and that's what Scripture shows us. He realized that the ultimate power of the universe could not possibly lie in someone like Nimrod. No matter how strong and influential Nimrod was, he was just a mere mortal and he would die one day. He could see that when people worshipped idols and stars and planets and towers, they were simply gratifying their own appetite to be accepted in their society. So, what can we know about Nimrod and Abraham? Abraham rejected the entire belief system of Nimrod. He nearly he was nearly killed by Nimrod for his refusal to follow in the footsteps of his father and his father's family to follow in the footsteps of his generation. He refused to commit idolatry, and this angered Nimrod. The sages tell us of the time when Nimrod called Abraham to his palace and commanded him to worship fire. When Nimrod asked Abraham to worship fire, Abraham replied, so let's worship water, since water has the power to extinguish fire. Right, said Nimrod, we should worship water. Abraham went on, well, in that case, we should worship the clouds, since they carry the water. Yes, we should worship the clouds, was Nimrod's response. Then we should worship the wind, the ruach, or the spirit, since it drives the clouds across the sky, Abraham added. Yes, we should worship the wind, the ruler agreed. But, said Abraham, humans have the power to rule over the spirit, so should we worship human beings? Now you're playing with words, cried Nimrod. I worship only fire, and I am going to throw you into a huge furnace. Let the God you worship come and save you from it. Now this is the story or the legend that's told about Abraham's encounter with Nimrod. Nimrod could not accept Abraham's 
provocative insight, he decided to throw him to his god of fire. He gave orders to construct an enormous furnace into which Abraham was then catapulted. The classic literature concludes that God miraculously saved Abraham from the fiery furnace, just as he saved Daniel's three friends centuries later. Now, both fiery furnaces were constructed in Babylon, in the same part of the world. Now, in another story, in the ancient literature, Abraham was nearly disowned by his own father when he smashed his father's idols. Terak once left Abraham in charge of his business because he had to leave town, and people came to buy idols from Abraham. Abraham asked one man, how old are you? And the man responded, 60. Abraham said, isn't it shameful that a man of 60 years of age wants to bow down to a one-day-old idol that was just made yesterday? And the man felt so ashamed that he left without buying an idol. Another time, a woman came in with a basket of bread and asked Abraham to offer the bread to the gods. Now, this is according to classic literature. Abraham saw an opportunity in this to destroy his father's idols. He smashed all his father's idols except the largest. Then he placed the hammer in the hand of the largest idol among them. Now, when his father came back, he saw all the broken idols, and he was angry. Who did this, he, re he cried. Well, Abraham said, how can I hide anything from you? A woman came with a basket of bread to offer to the idols. I placed the basket in front of them, and each one said, I'm going to eat first. Then the strongest idol took the hammer and destroyed all the others, because he wanted the bread for himself. His father, Terak, replied, What are you trying to pull on me? Do they have minds? And Abraham said, Listen to what your own mouth is saying. They have no power at all. Why worship idols? Now that was a very good question that he asked. As believers in Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, we understand the moral of these accounts. It is fruitless to worship what is not God. The technology in Abraham's world may seem primitive to us. Citizens live without electricity and without power tools, yet they built impressive buildings like the Ziggurat or the Tower of Babel. They demonstrated practical know-how that was in some ways far greater than what we have today. Their culture was as elaborate as what we see today, and their theological and philosophical systems were no less complex than what we know today. Their wise men and their priests attained high levels of knowledge in astronomy, mathematics, botany, and pharmacy, just to mention a few disciplines. They were so advanced in these, these areas that many of them would put our contemporary experts and specialists to shame. So in Abraham's world, all the ingredients for greatness were there. The people were united. They were in a central location right there in Abraham's backyard. The Babylonian sages and priests around Abraham were experts at many things. For them, it was a scientific fact that the planets and the stars ruled over everything on Earth. Long before astronomy, modern astronomy that is, revealed the mind-boggling immensity of the universe and the intense energy coming from the sun, Abraham's culture instinctively understood that the heavenly bodies radiate power. They believed the planets and the stars were the ultimate power in the universe, and they worshipped them. Many of their gods and goddesses were associated with particular planets or star constellations. The ancient Babylonians passed their pagan understanding down to Greece and Rome, who named their days of the week after these ancient star gods and gods of fertility, war, prosperity, and power. We still see these names today in our own days of the week, 
Monday, for instance, is named for the god of the moon. Tuesday is named for Tu, the god of war. Wednesday is named for Wooden, the god of death. Now, in the Feasts of Adonai, the book that I wrote on the biblical feasts, I explain how Hebrew culture differentiates their days of the week without using these pagan names. The Hebrew people only number their days of the week. Sunday is Yom Rishon, Monday is Yom Shani, and so forth. Only the seventh day each week is named in the Hebrew culture of Israel. The seventh day is the Sabbath or Shabbat. This is just some of the information that I share in the chapter on the Sabbath in the feast book. Now, Abraham spent the first part of his life in a culture that worshiped the stars. He saw the Tower of Babel. He knew the names of the star gods. One famous sage tried to explain Abraham's world. He wanted others to understand how humanity had lapsed into the worship of the celestial bodies. Now, let me just read what he wrote. He said, It happened in the days of Enosh, the grandson of Adam. The wise men of the time understood that the one God had created these stars and planets to control the workings of the world. They saw that he had placed the stars on high and given them such glory, for they are his officers and attending ministers. Accordingly, they thought it would be appropriate to praise and honor them, imagining that it must be God's will to show respect to beings that he himself had made so great as those stars in the sky. Just as an earthly king wants people to show respect for his servants and officers. Having reached this conclusion, they started building temples to the stars and planets and brought them sacrifices and offerings. They praised and glorified with words and prost prostrated before them in order as they imagined to fulfill the will of the Creator. With the passage of time, there arose false prophets who claimed that God had commanded them to worship a particular planet or all of the different constellations to bring them specific offerings and libations, to build them temples, and to make statues of the planet in order that the common people would be able to worship it. These prophets informed the people that a particular planet had a certain form that had been revealed to him in prophecy. In this way, people started making statues which were placed in temples or under trees and on mountains and hilltops. People would gather there to worship. The priests uh, the, used to tell the people that their statue had the power to benefit or to harm them and that they should worship and revere it. The priest told the people, what to do in order to elicit favor and to succeed in their various enterprises. Other deceivers arose, claiming that the planet or constellation or the angel itself had spoken to them and told them how to serve it. Cults of various kinds began to spread throughout the entire world. As time went on, the entire world became totally unaware of God. Their wise men imagined that there was no other god besides the stars and constellations, on whose account these various statues had been made, with the exception of a few individuals such as Enoch, Noah, Shem, and Avir. No one knew or recognized the creator of all the worlds. This was the way the world was until the birth of the pillar of the world, our father, Abraham. Now that's an ancient account. That's about 800 years old. But it does begin to explain how people were worshiping the constellations when Abraham was born. This was the world he was born into. In fact, this was the family he was born into because his father, Terak, was an idol worshiper. Now today, we looked at the birth of Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. What we learned was that Ur was a glistening city because the name Ur 
comes from the Hebrew word or, which means to shine. It was a glistening city, a decadent metropolis, if you will. It was a type of false Jerusalem. That's what we need to know. We learned that Abraham rose above his pagan culture and into the kingdom of God. On a future day, we will dine with Abraham in the kingdom of God. Yeshua said in Matthew 8:11, many will come from the east and from the west and take their place at the table with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We will one day eat a meal with Ava Shel Imina, the father of our faith. It's fascinating to think that Yeshua himself told us that we are going to dine one day with Abraham. We don't think about this very much. We know that Abraham was a tremendous man in scripture. In fact, over 300 scriptures in the Bible talk about this father of our faith. He did some remarkable things. He was tested in very trying ways, in ways that we will probably never be tested. But I believe Abraham has a word for us today and a lesson for us today. And that is this, that there are difficult times ahead. He faced difficult times in his own life. For instance, when he crossed over and came to the Promised Land, he was faced with famine. Now that was very challenging for him, considering that God had promised him abundance and blessing. But with famine in the land, he had to go to Egypt. And there in Egypt, we know that Pharaoh took his wife into his own palace to be there as one of his wives or in his harem, one of his concubines. These were trials for Abraham, trials that we will probably never face. But in spite of these trials, this father of our faith showed us that he followed God no matter what. He put all of his faith in God no matter what. There in Egypt, he had descended to a lower land and to a lower spiritual life because Egypt is spiritually lower than Israel. It's also physically lower than the terrain of Israel. In that dark land, he learned that only God could be his champion. Only God could defend him. Only God could deliver Sarah from Pharaoh's palace. And God did do that. And so this Ava Shel Imuna, this father of our faith, shows us what God can do. When we trust him, when we lay down our own strengths and trust him to be our champion, that's what the creator of our souls, the creator of this universe, can do for us. These ancient stories about Abraham really cause us to think. They cause us to realize that there's more to the story than what we know. Are those ancient accounts literally true? Maybe, maybe not. But we do know that Abraham lived in a world that was completely pagan. And wherever we are living in the world, we may be surrounded by pagans as well. We may live in a completely pagan neighborhood. We may live in a completely pagan region. Or we may find ourselves in a completely pagan nation, in a nation that has forgotten about God. It may be that those who know God and are cleaving to Him, holding fast to Him, are unpopular or persecuted, um, or in some way are not part of the popular culture. In spite of this, we have to trust. If this is us, we have to trust. We have to cleave to our Creator. We have to know that He has a plan for us. He has a destiny for us, just as He had for Abraham. In spite of the fact that Abraham was surrounded by pagans, God found him. God found him, and he found God. God has the same thing for us. Wherever we are in the world, he can find us. Like Abraham, we must find him. If we don't know God, we might try walking outside as Abraham did and looking up at the stars, looking up at the planets and the constellations and realizing their pattern and their design is artistic. 
It took an artist to make them. Their pattern and their design is not random. It is divine, it is holy, it is sacred. And it was made by one who is holy and one is sacred. One who is sacred. It was made by the God of the universe. Yehovah Olam, the God of the universe. Abraham, this father of our faith, is someone that we're going to sit down and have a meal with someday. And this father of our faith was the very first one to ever use the name Yohava Olam. He was the first one to speak that. We find that expression in Genesis 21:33. He was the very first one to refer to God as the king of the universe. That's what we learn from Abraham. It's going to be exciting to meet him one day and to dine with him, to eat with him. We wouldn't actually know about this future table in the kingdom if Yeshua hadn't told us about the table. But he tells us about the table. Will that feast be called the marriage supper of the Lamb? I think that's what scripture tells us. And at this marriage supper of the Lamb, we will come from the West if we're living in America. We will come from the East if we're living closer to Israel. But we will sit at that table with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if we've never thought, thought very much about the lives of the three patriarchs of Israel, we need to know these men because we're going to have dinner conversation with them one day. We need to know what they did and why they did it. They lead the way for us. The decisions they make can help us make accurate decisions as well. Abraham made right decisions. He heard God speak to him. When God spoke to him in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Abraham had absolutely no trouble hearing God speak. Can we hear God speak? Do we know his voice? He wants to speak to us. All throughout scripture, we learn that God is a God who communicates. We know from the feast days that he's a God of celebration, and he wants us to celebrate with him. And we know from scripture that he is a God who speaks. He has something to say to us. This great God that we serve, this great God that we want to serve if we don't serve him now, this God that we want to know better is waiting to know us. He's waiting to speak with us. Just as he spoke to Abraham, he will speak to us. He is the one who will keep us safe to that day and bring us to the dining table in the kingdom of God. When we are in the kingdom of God, we will dine with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We will share a meal with them and they will tell us about their lives. And we will tell them about our journey as well. Was our journey difficult? Abraham's journey was certainly difficult. But Abraham shows us faith through a mountain. Isaac shows us faith through a field. And Jacob shows us faith through a house. They all contribute to our faith. In one way or another, they all contribute to our faith in the one true God of heaven and earth, the God of Israel and his Messiah, Yeshua, our King. We can be encouraged by this and excited by this. Abraham was born in a pagan area, but he found God, and God found him. And now he is our Ava Shel Imuna, the father of our faith. He encourages us to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Kol levav, kol nefesh, and kol meod. This is how Deuteronomy 6.5 tells us to love God. Abraham led the way in that. He showed us the way. And as a result of that, he became the father of our faith and one who will sit at the table, maybe not the head of the table, in the kingdom of God but he will sit close to the head of the table. Those are the ones that Yeshua identified when he talked about that future supper, that future meal that we will eat with him. We will eat it not just with him alone, 
not just with the body of believers in the kingdom of God, but with the patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's be encouraged by this great father of our faith. We will reach that table one day. We will eat that meal one day. No matter what trials we are going through, no matter what trials, even if our tri trials are as severe as Abraham's trials, the God of heaven and earth is watching us. He watches over us. He has a plan. He has a destiny. He knows what he wants us to do. If we're listening for that voice, we will hear it. If we want to know his plan, he will show it. We can trust him in that. He showed Abraham the way. He can show us the way as well. We can be excited about this father of our faith and the fact that we will one day dine with him in the kingdom of God. We will dine with Abraham in the kingdom of God.